The Athletic. The race is on. And the 2023 F1 season is finally over after one last day of testing in Abu Dhabi. But with 25 drivers in action, Alpine's Esteban Ocon fastest and the strangest red flag of the season, what did we actually learn? I'm Ed Straw and joining us to pick out the key storylines from the start of the off-season are Glenn Freeman and Scott mitchell Malm. Well, Scott, I've got a bone to pick with you. You left me with the test. I had to do it on my own. I did. I, I felt I felt bad, but then on the other hand, I didn't feel bad at all. So um, I, 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 it worked out fine for me. The one thing I was was considering was maybe we should buy into the theme of the the rookie test, the young driver test, and we should send um, Josh Sutil out there purely just for one day of the 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 punishment of covering the the single day of action in the Abu Dhabi test. And I feel like if we're all on board with that, then unless Josh speaks up right now and says, no, he's not interested in that, I think we lock that in for next year and condemn him to 24 hours in Abu Dhabi at the end of a very long and gruelling season. What do you say, Josh? Ah, your silence speaks volumes. (laughs) That's a plan for next year. And Glenn Freeman, who also wasn't at the test, but admittedly didn't have any particular reason to be, (laughs) did you pay much attention to it? Or was this just a bit of a, oh yeah, there's still a bit of F1 going on after it all finished? Um, Well, I was going to ask, uh, if Josh is doing the young driver element of the test, who's going to be your tyre tester? Uh, Ed, does one yeah, of you no, two no, have to Ed. do that as the race drivers, or is <laughs> that, that Ed's just Ed? No, 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 he no, goes, no, no, no. no. You're, you're there. It's you, we, we've, we've, we've agreed this in my head. You're the benchmark, and I don't spend any more time covering Formula One on site than I have to at the end of next year when we've done 24 races. Well, I think for tire testing, you need someone who can just drone round and round and round. I think you're perfect for it, surely. Uh, well, that or maybe Ben Anderson. <laughs> one of the two of you, definitely. Actually, yeah, we can send Ben as well. That's that's sorted that one out. But yeah, it's always quite funny, the final test, because you go into the paddock and it's a bit like it was at the weekend, but there's packing crates everywhere. It's all being half packed up, etc. We even had, um, as Chris Medland was following on, on Twitter... Uh, or X, as I should call it, a, a Mercedes, uh, uh, somebody who works for Mercedes who managed to lose their uh, wedding ring in the marina. It, that was being searched for on uh, on Tuesday night. And apparently he recently tweeted that it, it was found. So that was quite uh, dramatic. We were watching a little bit of that last night. So loads and loads and loads of storylines for us <laughs> to uh, get into. So, Scott, there are a total of 11 drivers in action in the young driver test elements of running. Which one of those would you say has the best chance of landing an F1 seat in the near future? Yeah, it was quite a, quite an interesting mix, wasn't it, of um, what might be best termed as you know like legitimate young drivers, drivers that are still on the come up and still harbour realistic or semi realistic ambitions of getting into Formula One. So you know, n- nearly Formula Two champion uh, Fred Vesti at Mercedes, actual F two champion Teo Porcher at Alfa Romeo. Um, then uh, you just slightly younger younger guys, Oli Bear, uh, Behrman, um, the, the the Williams pair, uh, Franco Colapinto, Zach O'Sullivan, and then it just a just a nice little mix of um, Jake, like Jake Dennis, for example, former world champion and long time Red Bull sim driver, Felipe Drugovic is kind of. I feel like if you're F2 champion, you've not got into F1 after a couple of years out, which he's not going to do next year. How realistic are your chances of getting there? And then, you know, I think like a Pato Award is probably like my favourite genre of driver to appear at a test like this because they're, they're someone who, apps, we'll talk about this a bit later, I know, but they're someone who will talk so passionately about the prospect of getting to F1 and they're very, very good in their own series, but they're kind of just here through a affiliation and like it just uh yeah they <laughs> they satisfy the young driver part certainly but they're not f1 hopeful so i think of that list you've got to look at the people that are still in f2 or been competing in f2 and i think ollie bearman is the is the one that stands out to me because he kind of ticks that box uh, ticks all the boxes in terms of um still young enough to be very much in the ascendancy uh, he's shown a lot of promise in f2 already as uh, in, and he's super young i think he's still only 18 uh, he's got proper ferrari back in behind him so someone like that uh you know racking up the mileage with Haas, i think means m- means uh, a lot more to me than say you know a drugovic who's parked at aston martin as an f2 champion who'll probably never get to f1 and even a poor share who and those we'll talk about him a little bit later. I feel like if he was stepping up to F1, he would do it with the team that's meant to be backing him already. 
it uh, it hurts this test a little bit, doesn't it? When you've got a static driver market. If you think back to a year ago, we had Fernando Alonso running in the unbranded Aston Martin. You just get those those nice little moments where you see someone in a car they've not been in before, and and you see somebody putting the work in to to get a head start on next year, and it gives you some proper storylines worth following at this test. Even the ridiculous year when Alonso turned up. In a, in a young driver's seat. And I admire the commitment of the F1 fans who still joke about him as a, as a hot new talent and looking forward to what he can achieve in years to come. But I, I felt it hurt this test that there was nothing like that. Someone pointed out to me the other day, now it looks like uh, Logan Sargent's going to keep the Williams seat. Have we ever had a driver market where nothing changed from one year to the next? No, I did check up on this before. I didn't think it had happened. And yeah, we should have, assuming Sergeant keeps the seat, and I think he will, it's not officially confirmed, it'll be the same 20 drivers in Bahrain at the start of next year, barring the unexpected, as it was in Abu Dhabi, which is, yeah, the definition of stagnant. That's boring, isn't it? The one hope is that sometimes it goes in cycles, doesn't it? And 25, there's quite good potential for shuffles. And there were quite a few shuffles in 23. So we've gone into... Odd number years are exciting, even number years are dull, it's, <laughs> it seems to be. But it, it was funny, the lineup for this young driver test. I've been at quite a few of these young driver tests over the years. And this one was the least interesting, not specifically because of the drivers, but most of them had run in FP1 the previous Friday for a start. And I think there are only two drivers having their first sort of public F1 tests, um, Franco Colapinto in the Williams and Ayumu Uwaza in the Alpha Tari. So it lacked a little bit of that edge as well. That they, you know, they're not familiar people who have been testing endlessly, but yeah, the, the, the storylines weren't quite so exciting, which I think put a bit of a, a bit of a, a dampener on it. But it's always interesting to see how they get on. But yeah, it was a it was a bit more of a regulation test rather than an exciting young driver test. Yeah, it felt like something that <laughs> in a lot of a lot of ways it was just sort of everybody was ticking it off because they had to. Um, we know that when like the race drivers turn up for one last half day or even a full day in the car, um, that's very much done out of um, requirement rather than desire to keep pounding round. Um, I I was just thinking when we were talking about you know the stagnation. I think when I stayed out in I think it was at the end of 2018, that was a phenomenally fun driver test to to follow because I think you had Leclerc would have been in the Ferrari. Um, Raikkonen was in the Sauber um, sign switch to would it have been it would have been in the McLaren at that point would that have been his first year in the McLaren I think it might have been um, I think I think they were just like everything every team just had someone new in it and it was just really quite fun because you're kind of thinking oh actually this is um, there's just uh, there's so much intrigue and you you don't you just really don't have to try to find something interesting and that's why like last year was was quite fun with like with the Alonso thing and running in the unbranded Aston it was just like there was an immediate quirk right from the first minute that the cars went on track and you're just instantly just like okay there's there is just something here to to hook us whereas this year was a great reminder of the fact that testing isn't for us and it isn't for the fans and it is just fundamentally a really boring activity (laughs) yeah very uh very much so Glenn what caught your eye from this test um uh, I suppose it was quite interesting when you said there was a red flag for um, water on the track. We don't hear that very often in Abu Dhabi, do we? Yeah, that was quite unexpected. Uh, yeah, the, the information screen said a water leak between turns 13 and 14. My initial suggestion was that perhaps the marina had burst its banks, but uh, it turned out that it was coming from Tidal the... Tidal marina. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It was coming from the, the bridge of the W Hotel, which is that big hotel that you can see over it. I think it used to be called the Viceroy, didn't it? And it was a mixture of water and grease, so it took them 24 minutes or something to clean all of that up, which was quite an unusual one, because initially when you saw a water leak, you think, oh, maybe that's from a car. But no, it was from uh, it was from the bridge so it's a little bit like that year at Monaco not quite so extreme as then but if you remember there was Monaco in oh I can't remember which year it was I want to say something like eight, was 83 84 somewhere around there when they uh they had it was the, the crazy 82 race wasn't it, it before might have been the, 82, the crazy yeah. 82 race started when the tunnel yeah went. yeah it was one of the, I can't I'm I just sure forget the arc but I can remember the footage of seeing the water coming down and the tunnel and everything and it was yeah just, just a one proper of those leak. things yeah exactly yeah this was much much more minor but uh, amusing nonetheless we had a few things this year didn't we that were 
were kind of odd. I do. I, I think I will agree. I think this just about shades it as the strangest one. There was the obvious one was, um, you know, recency bias Vegas with the with the drain cover. But I'm sure, like can, Canada practice started, didn't it, before that CCTV issue caused it to be red flagged. That wasn't the the session didn't just never get going, did it? I'm pretty sure that one started. Yeah, if memory serves, yeah, if memory serves, it started and then stopped. It's difficult to remember that far back with so many races. I was there, and I, I vaguely <laughs> remember a, it, but yeah, yeah, it did get another, underway, didn't it? That was another strange one because I remember that just being like, this is such a lame reason for us not to be able to have any kind of track running. And we've had stuff before, haven't we? Where didn't this actually another strange thing about this test? Didn't it take a while for the much to your pleasure, Ed? Because I believe you had a bit of a nightmare journey down from Dubai for it. Um, but didn't the test start a bit late as well because of some uh, a, a classic a classic testing logistical issue? Yeah, the medical helicopter wasn't there, so it was 25 minutes late starting. It's funny, they were talking about extending the session to make up for it, but uh, the teams actually pushed back a bit. I think they said, no, no more, and there was actually a regulation that they uh, that they dug up. I think it was Sauber that, uh, that flagged it properly, so uh, an attempt to extend it by 25 minutes or whatever was uh, was stymied because of the wording of the rules. So it's just even the those... people that get something out of the test don't want the test to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, no more of this, no more. We want to finish at six o'clock. I think there was even talk about finishing it an hour early um, when they were discussing it before. But uh, yeah, pretty tough for uh, for everyone working in, in those teams. But even so, I don't want to be too down on it because there were opportunities for these drivers to to get some mileage and particularly for the the young drivers that's that's quite important but Glenn in general there are precious few chances for young drivers to build F1 experience and less chances than ever to earn a race seat do you think F1's letting young drivers down and perhaps more importantly actually hurting itself by narrowing the driver pool so much 1981 for the Monaco tunnel leak fire in the hotel and then I guess a leak relating to that uh, had to get in. Had to correct myself. Hate getting things like that wrong. Yeah, we we were, we were all wrong with the year. We were right in the right half of the of the right decade. So that's close early eighties. Should have just said that. Stay vague. You get less wrong. Uh, to answer your actual question, Kevin Magnussen made an interesting point about this over the weekend, didn't he? He got asked about the, giving up the car for FP one, and he said he's fine with it. He thinks it's better than the lack of opportunities he had when he was coming through. So that was around 2012, 2013, when he was on the cusp of F1. Early 2010s, keep it vague. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and he got the odd young driver test then. And I don't really think time in F1 cars is the big problem here. People like to cite things like, oh, Lewis Hamilton did a crazy amount of kilometres before he got into F1. That was great. The issue is further down the ladder and the driver pool is smaller at the F2 level because it's so hard to stay on the ladder to get to the F2 level because it's so expensive. It's such, I think, poor value for money. So more and more drivers hop off that ladder to go to sports cars or wherever else they go, even IndyCar now, lots of drivers doing that, Um, rather than persisting and trying to find the money to do F2, which is ridiculously expensive now, and everything below it gets dragged up as well. They're all ridiculously expensive. So the driver pool is shrinking. Uh, I think what we talked about earlier regarding the lack of, you know, no changes in the driver market for next year, it looks, that's also partly a result of the fact that there are there are going to be fewer talents vying or knocking on the door or knocking the door down to get in. So I don't actually think the problem lies with oh, this isn't we don't need to bring back f1 test drivers who pound round all year that's not going to get us a load more fresh f1 rookies coming in who are who are brilliant and are of the level we need it's a bigger problem i would say that maybe that probably still is f1's problem in that if f1 thinks it can ring fence itself off from the junior ladder and you know, F1 teams and F1 itself, the organisation, if they think they don't need to get involved in that because if any, if anyone's good enough, they'll get through anywhere and then you can just sign them or you pick your guys up young, you put them through and then you just, you bring those guys up. But we can see there are lots of junior drivers at the moment and in recent years who are being backed through the levels and then the teams that back them, as Scott said earlier, that if the team that backs you decides you're not good enough, it's highly unlikely someone else who knows less about you is going to take a chance on you. So 
I think narrowing pool is a problem. I just I wouldn't put it down to a lack of F1 seat time as being the root cause. I think we've ended up in a situation where, in a regulatory sense, when there's such an emphasis on managing costs and everything, we're in quite a good place at the moment for just guaranteeing a few opportunities. Like that, that is better, I think, and that is in a reasonable position. You know, uh, it doesn't sound like a huge amount, but putting young drivers in for FP1 is actually quite a big thing to put a young driver through. Um, having, you know, a guaranteed day in every single car at the end of the season is a very good thing to do. And we know that the teams that have proper young driver programs and, you know, decent amount of money behind them, which a lot of the teams do now because of the cost cap and the franchise model and blah, 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 and everyone's in a better place. There is actually quite a lot of instances now where that old car testing is actually borderline prolific, depending on if you're on the right program and if you're the right driver. So those opportunities do exist, which I think is is very good. The, 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 the issue is that I think we're at a point where I think the incentive to change your driver lineup is probably lower than it's been for a very long time, if ever, in F1, because the cars are so complicated. But also, the my personal opinion is that the, the ground effect cars are really specific to drive. I think they are... Um, what's the what's the word? It's almost like uh, they're an even more kind of like bespoke discipline of single seater to drive than F one was before. You talk, you look at over the course of this season and last season, just how easily established mega drivers are suddenly thrown out of the window that we hear people talk about so much, and it just feels like that's tougher than ever. So, if you devote your time to, and I, I I'm not using these because I'm trying to insult them, but just because I think they are at the sort of lesser end of the scale of like mega young protégés protégés to come through. But if you devote a year or two to a Joe Guan Yu or a year to a Logan Sargent, what what incentive is there to, to sort of toss all that work out the window and start afresh the following year for someone who isn't an absolute, absolute mega? I think if you had a Charles Leclerc winning F2 now, I, I think Sauber or, or Haas would be, or Williams would be remiss not to put them in the car. But with all due respect to them, your Filippo Drogovic's, your Teo Porsches, your third year F2 champions up against the relatively, you know, good but not great crop of drivers, I don't think you're hammering the door down. And I think that's where the problem is. So so you just have, you've got a lovely network of um, practice sessions and tests and all of this and year a uh, two-year-old car running and blah 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 to just you know get your get your junior drivers nice mileage in fairly relevant cars but in terms of putting them in these cars racing them in these cars i just i just get the impression teams are more hesitant than ever to do that i think oscar piastri is a good example here you mentioned the the running in old cars he had an extensive program of that with alpine before before he cut and run but mclaren didn't fight to sign him because they knew he had lots of old generation car mileage. They fought to sign him because they knew he was a mega talent. And because he was a mega talent, over the course of this season, he backs that up as a rookie in F1. So, yeah, I think the issue is it's it's not yeah, it's, it's not a reflection of how you prepare them. It's a reflection of how good they are as they as they climb up the ranks. And this this happens. We get these cycles. You you look back at since we had the rebrand of uh, Formula 3000 became GP2, it wasn't a rebrand, it's a totally new category. You had a, a mega run of champions at the start, you know, Rosberg, Hamilton, Timo Glock. Then you had the Pantano year. Okay, we won't talk about that now. Then you get Hulkenberg. You get Maldonado and Grosjean were the next two after that. Both perfectly acceptable F1 drivers in their own ways. Then in uh, 2012, 13 and 14, you had Davide Valsecchi, Fabio Lima. Julian Palmer. Palmer drove well in his championship winning season, but he'd been there a long time. There wasn't that excitement around him. He got in, I think it'd be fair to say, Ed, through financial gain that he could bring to the team that hired him. Um, then you had Van Dorn, Gasly, Leclerc, Russell, another great bunch of, of, of champions. Then you had De Vries and Schumacher, a tier below. Then you have Piastri, brilliant, another mega one. We've just talked about him. He's been superb. Now we have Drugovic and, and Porcher and it just, there will be another cycle. There'll be another wave of talents. I, I find it, 
I've always found it fascinating how a bunch of them seem to come up together. You know, they you can all you can often track a lot of them back to karting together and they come up through the ranks. And then what often happens is those guys will make it and the guys they were beating on the way up are the ones left behind and then they fight for some championships and the F1 teams don't pay as much attention. So although I'm concerned that I think the the waves of talent that we get, those peaks, I think, will be smaller and shorter because there'll be fewer of those drivers who get there. It will happen again. No, I think that's fair. And 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 if you look at the if you look at the history of the drivers who have come in when they're not like like a, as I sort of put it, like the bang the door down talent. So you know, like a like Mick Schumacher, for example, he came in. He I think did a good job in difficult circumstances in his rookie season, but he didn't make the necessary step that he needed in the second. And I think in that situation, it's fine to jettison a driver after two years because I think you've given them more of a chance. But that that's what happens when you have um, again absolute respect to them because I think he's a perfectly fine racing driver. If you don't have an absolute megastar come through. That that's kind of the risk that they have. They have a couple of years, and they they you know they 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 sink or or they swim, and and that can put teams off giving bigger chances to to rookies again. But I think it does just depend on the rookie. And I think as um as a little well m- mini spoiler, I suppose one of the pieces that I'll probably work on over the winter is something looking a little bit closer at Ollie Behrman and why there's um a bit of a suggestion from Haas that he could be the kind of rookie that makes them drop Gunter Steiner's not quite hard line don't want a rookie policy because it's all about the the right rookie it isn't it's not a blanket term you know you don't one one rookie doesn't speak for all of them and if the right drive is there I think they will get the opportunity it's just with the situation that everybody's in at the moment and I'm just trying really careful to be really careful here not to step on the toes of stuff we're going to talk about in a little bit you just have a situation where, you know, a Salva's invested that time in Joe Guan Yu. He's a likable person. He's doing a reasonable job, but not a stunning job. And if they don't believe that Teo Porsche, for example, is an absolute cast iron upgrade across the board for all of the things you need to do as an F1 driver, I don't think you're going to put yourself willingly through the awkwardness of having to train another driver up again. A no rookie policy is a good way of batting off questions or approaches around rookies while they're not good enough and I would expect any team including Haas to drop that policy as you said Scott if the right rookie comes along I think that all depends on Gene Haas over and above Gunter Steiner ultimately as Gene Haas is the guy who owns the team so he's probably the one who has to be convinced but I think that could be something well worth them uh, considering I think the one thing about the young drivers is I quite like to see a little bit more because I agree with your broad point Glenn that the real mega drivers are able to make an impression but then you think of cases like when you had the Friday drivers and Robert Kubica was able to force his way in just with consistently strong performances on Grand Prix weekends maybe the there's third a car stuff was absolutely superb I remember being at uh, I went to a couple of races in 2006 uh, when I was at Motorsport News and watching Kubica it was worth going trackside on a Friday just to watch Kubica he was that mind-blowing I, I can I can immediately see him dancing the car through cops at Silverstone, for example, on the Friday. And I just remember going, wow. Like I, I'd, I'd heard a lot about him in 2005 when he won World Series by Renault. But you're right. It was seeing him in that car every weekend, seeing what he could do with it. Admittedly, with no restrictions around sort of uh, engine life and that sort of thing. But you're right. That, that, that era was a great um, a great way of incorporating drivers into Fridays. I actually think the system we have now, the fact that everybody left, pretty much everybody left it until Abu Dhabi tells you that the teams aren't taking it that seriously at the moment, what we have now. Yeah, they may need to be incentivised a little bit and slightly broaden it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't see much sign that's being seriously considered. But anyway, I would like to see a little bit more, but I also do think the absolutely brilliant ones do rise. But we've got to be very careful about F1's pool getting too stagnant. We'll get back to the pod in a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about an interesting event I went to while I was in Abu Dhabi, all about an exciting new autonomous racing series called A2RL. At the event, I spoke to Dr. Tom McCarthy, a key player in the series, who started off by telling me what A2RL stands for and what it's all about. 
A2RL is the Abu Dhabi Autonomous Racing League. Uh, we're having our first race in uh, the Yas Marina circuit at the end of April 2024. And uh, we are taking uh, Super Formula racing cars, designed and developed by Delara, and uh, switching out the driver for uh, an autonomous racing stack. Um, that racing stack will uh, utilize all the data collected from a perception stack and uh, drive the car autonomously around the track and against other cars. Obviously, we're talking about artificial intelligence and autonomous cars. I imagine a lot of people listening will have a very broad idea of what that is. But obviously, AI is a very broad church. There's a lot of different types of, of AI. So it's worth perhaps getting into what this car actually is, what the sensor package is, how it's actually driving the car. So perhaps you can just explain how that all fits together and I guess how autonomous it actually is, is, is perhaps the basic way to phrase the question. You know, when we see uh, the Formula One racing today we obviously see a car with a driver in it who does all the actuation and has the eyes and the ears on the road and the driving skill to um, move that car around the track but also is backed up by a technical team that is feeding in information feeding in strategy so i guess first thing we're doing is switching the roles you know the actual person that is uh, at the wheel if you like uh, is uh, the coder and ultimately they have to put in place uh, the ability for that car to uh, navigate the track as effectively and efficiently and as fast as possible and to avoid obstacles like other cars and passing those cars out so the essential characteristic of this car is it is one design both in its physical components uh, and in its uh, uh, stack, autonomous stack component, the differentiator is brought down to the programming. And obviously, one of the fun things with any of this sort of technology is guessing what might come out of it, because it's quite easy to conceptualise this as replicating a human driver, and that's part of it. But also, it's interesting, if you look at some of the experiments that have been done with AI and machine learning on simple games some of the strategies that can be worked out to achieve things are completely different to what humans may have come up with themselves. And obviously, motor racing has been happening for well over 100 years, so a lot's been learned. But do you think that this pathway could lead to genuine breakthroughs in terms of even driving technique, that kind of thing? Just There are things out there that are probably still to be learned. We don't know what they are, but that, that's the exciting thing about this, isn't it? There could actually be things that then feed back into human drivers. For me, I think it is that interaction between the human and the autonomous element is where we're going to learn a lot. In other words, that the, the autonomous element itself has to learn how to best and optimally assist. And this is why I push away from always focusing on driverless cars being the outcome. Our big learning will be how the autonomy sits alongside the human in the car and how we bridge the gap between what a car can do at the edge of friction and what an average driver can do. You know, so it is not about... AI replacing the human. It's about AI working with the human input in order to optimize the output for the benefit of the human. You know, some people ask me the question, gee, is this replacing Formula One? Absolutely not. Would I ever want it to know? Do we always want to see a human sitting in this vehicle going, of course we do. Uh, when we started out in doing this, uh, we said we wanted to start at the frontiers of science not do something that was easy. Now, we know that you can put two cars out in the track and race against each other autonomously. You can do that at a fair amount of speed. And that becomes a core element of the race. But we also want to go beyond that. Well, Scott, you mentioned Pato Ward earlier. He was in action for McLaren, clearly growing in confidence in the car. He laid out his dream that maybe he could give McLaren an Indy 500 win and then perhaps find a way onto the F1 grid. Do you think there's any chance of that happening? The second bit of it, I think an Indy 500 win is perfectly plausible. Um, I'd like to see it because I think it would be one of those crossovers that's just generally very, very entertaining. Um, and I think O'Ward is the kind of driver that if you got him in a an F1 car that allowed him to do what makes him qu just quite a special talent in in IndyCar. You know, if you had a proper fast hands award in an F1 car, that would be quite special. I'm a little bit wary that you can't really drive an F1 car like that and make no, it... fast quick. hands award would be slow in an F1 car, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, so, so, and he's talked about, you know, he thinks he'd be able to, you know, things he can drive an f1 car the way it needs to be driven so it's not really about whether he could become a competitive f1 driver necessarily i just don't think i think if he became a competitive f1 driver it wouldn't be for the reasons why he's so exciting to watch in indycar it'll be because he's a good driver and he adapts to the machine that he has so i'd like to see it just to just for, for the various reasons i just mentioned but 
I'm I'm struggling to imagine it because I don't think he's at the top of the queue. Um, I don't think he was at the top of the queue for the last couple of years anyway. It was very clear that Alex Pelot was kind of McLaren's priority there in terms of making him an F1 reserve. Now, that was partly due to circumstance because Pelot had a super license and awards only just getting his now. But it was it seemed pretty obvious that Pelot had made a better impression on McLaren in the F1 opportunities he'd been given. Not that Pato made a bad impression, it's just the, the, the standard's incredibly high. And I think he's now kind of further up the reserve priority list just by default because obviously Pelot's not going to be doing that next year and is in all kinds of strife with, with McLaren still. But I feel like getting into a position where you're going to have more F1 opportunities almost by default because you've just been really loyal, all that's going to achieve is getting you these peripheral F1 opportunities. So FP1 outings, young driver tests, stuff that's going to make Award a better driver and stuff that's going to give him some really great experiences. But is it going to really put him on the brink of an F1 drive in the future? I think you'd have to see a dramatic a dramatic change, not only in McLaren's driver situation, which means Norris and Piastri probably disappearing, but also a bit of a slump in their place in the team pecking order because right now if you lost a Norris and a Piastri you could replace them with probably three quarters of the grid would like to drive for McLaren at the moment with the way that they've ended the 2023 season so you're just not going to have a shortage of more appropriate options than taking a punt on someone like O'Ward. I think McLaren are, are being quite clever here and I think they they are dangling the F1 carrot as a way of making themselves more powerful in the IndyCar driver market. And I think that applied to Pelot as well. I, d- I don't think... I think they were they were curious to see if he had it in an F1 car because, based on his career in Europe, when he got to America, he surprised everybody. So I think there was a curiosity there of, is this level you found in IndyCar transferable to an F1 car? But I still think, even then, the all oh, this can be a... Come and join our IndyCar team and it can be a pathway to F1... I think that was a, it was a move to get Pelo, which has ultimately turned out to fail. I think it's a move to keep O'Ward happy as well. And I think their their aim for O'Ward is to have a long, successful IndyCar relationship with him. I think, yeah, as you said, Ed, winning the Indy 500 is, is utterly achievable for driver and team. They're, they're quick at Indy. O'Ward's good at Indy. I just think that I think there's there's a little bit of a game going on here because nobody else in that paddock can offer what McLaren can offer. And uh, I know that a lot of the IndyCar teams don't like the way McLaren, and quite often it's pinned on Zach Brown, go about their business in IndyCar. I don't have a problem with that. This is cutthroat. It's motorsport. It's, it's professional sport. Do what you've got to do to get the people you want um you know step on toes if you have to but i just think i just think that you know you you keep finding ways to put pato in the car you keep telling him it might happen and he might just be more likely to keep signing those contract extensions in america i think that's the goal yeah i think that's very very likely i, I did ask oward about whether as he does more of this he thinks he's able to uh, CF1 is a slightly more serious possibility. And he sort of said, well, yeah, I'd like I'd like to win the 500 and it'd be great to get an opportunity here. And he sort of said, well, I'd like it to be more than just seeing what F1's got to offer and coming here and enjoying it and being made into a better driver. But the kind of unstated point he was making there is, yeah, I know what this is. But I guess there's always that possibility that if you're in the car, you could make an impression or if you as a reserve, you get a chance. You never know what might happen. So it's I get the feeling everything he's doing in F1 is a bit of a bonus and you never know when something might happen. But as I always say about the guys who are doing well in IndyCar, you don't want to throw away a great IndyCar career for a mediocre F1 career. And the problem is you often have to, if you do have a chance, if you can force a chance, it could well be the start of a mediocre Grand Prix career, shall we say. In terms of the opportunities you get, you might get a season or a season and a half in something not that good. And then that can can cause you problems and dent your career. So yeah, they have to be a little bit careful with it. But it's great. Pato Award seems to be really enjoying it and he's, he's doing a good job. So at the, at the absolute worst, he's just having a lovely time and McLaren are just having a slightly more appealing package for their drivers. But Glenn, how about 
Sergio Perez. Well, half the teams split the running in the tyre test element between their race drivers. Some only had one driver and Sergio Perez was given all of the day in the Red Bull Max Verstappen. Very, very little left for him to learn and prove this year. So uh, a well-deserved day off for you. So he characterised it as the chance to do some important homework for 24. So does the Perez title challenge start here? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I ran some maths to back that claim up. In the last, let's face it, you've got to look at what's this day going to change compared to the evidence, the two years of evidence we have with this uh, this family of Red Bull cars now and over the last two years Perez has scored 590 points uh, which would have only just won him this year's championship against Verstappen Max has scored over a thousand so an extra day of work in a car that next year's car will be an evolution of this I'm sure it's not going to turn him into a title challenger however I I have a lot of respect for him doing that job and taking it that seriously. I believe it can improve him for next year. It's just not going to turn him into a title contender. I, I enjoyed the clip that's been going around of um, Max and Fernando Alonso interviewing each other in the uh, driver pen afterwards. And they had a little chat. I think Fernando asked Max, oh, are you doing the test? And uh, bless him, Max is... Uh, the way Max delivered his no, he might as well have said, don't be ridiculous. Are you, are you absolutely mad? And... As you said, Max has well and truly earned the right to skip this test. But I, I was very amused by it. He was almost he was almost affronted in a polite way of the notion that he might have to drive at this test. However, for Perez, who's had a difficult year, any day in the car, extra day in the car should be valuable. So I totally believe that he got the opportunity to do some important homework for 2024. But it's not the start of a title challenge. If... if if the Red Bull is dominant next year, we've just seen what happens. Max will win at a canter. Um, Perez actually scored fewer points in a more dominant car this year than the year before. Uh, and if the, if the competition's got closer, Sergio will fall down the order a little bit. He'll be scrapping with the chasing pack more and it'll be Max fighting uh, a Mercedes or a Ferrari or a McLaren on his own. Um, so... Yeah, I, I don't want to give Checo a dressing down like that by any means, but in direct answer to your question, your leading question, Ed, uh, no, there's not a title challenge on the horizon. Well, it was interesting because actually one point I should make about the the tyre test, there might be those who are thinking, well, Verstappen should be taking every opportunity to test, but the 24 tyres are identical to the 23 tyres, so there's nothing new. The compounds aren't changing, the construction's the same, so it's not like he's missed an opportunity there. I would say if the tyres were changing in a meaningful way, it would be worth his while doing it, and he probably would do it. But but anyway, um, I did I did ask Checo after his running about you know the benefit of just having a day, because it was focused on him. They weren't doing tyre testing, they were doing Perez testing. So it was all about trying to build on that work he's done late in the season. I, I did ask him, well, how different might your year been have been had you had the opportunity to do this same mid-season? Because it's all well and good trying to do it in free practice sessions or what, but it, it, you can't get a huge amount done. But if he had a huge te- a few test days, which he could have done 15 years ago, it might have changed things. And he said it, it would have done. And I, I can see why it would have helped. I don't think, again, it's going to transform it. But the positive thing is he's he's being honest about it. He said that he had difficulties with the car and he's trying to understand the philosophy of the car and what he can do to get more out of it for next year. So it's all about, yeah, starting better next year. Championship challenge would be a huge surprise, but uh, certainly a better season, which is what he needs to have to be able to try and extend his time at uh, at Red Bull or earn himself a drive elsewhere. So, yeah, a productive day for him at least. Right, Scott, let's get back to somebody you referenced earlier, Theo Pocher. He clinched the F2 crown last Sunday. No chance of a race seat for him in 24, and he's hoping to get a super formula seat nailed down. Uh, He sounded pretty confident that will happen, although it's not done and dusted as yet. Can you see some kind of Oscar Piastri or Liam Lawson type trajectory for Pocher? Uh, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I think he is going to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more vulnerable to, or not vulnerable, but maybe dependent on um, circumstances going in his favour, even more so than Lawson was, because ultimately 
Lawson was uh, a bit more uh, unconvincing after F2, but felt like he hadn't hadn't quite reached the zenith of his uh, junior career, and going out to Super Formula was kind of that like last roll of the dice. Um, when and then when he went out there, he upped his game, which was already sort of slowly increasing his stock a little bit. And then obviously the circumstances around uh, the Alpha Tauri seat, not just with Nick DeVries being binned off, but then obviously Ricardo breaking his hand, then then gave Lawson a platform he wouldn't have had uh, otherwise. I feel like Porsche needs a little bit of that, but the circumstance isn't even quite the same because he has now won F2. He has, in theory, proven himself and conquered the biggest thing you're meant to conquer to get to F1 which is the main feeder category. And Sauber still doesn't think he is worth giving an F1 seat to. And the person that they're not willing to drop for him isn't a megastar. It's Joe Guan Yu. And I like Joe. I think he's done a decent job in, in, in Formula One. And he's a, very, he's, a, he's a very lovely guy. And he's a very hard worker within the team, popular member within the team. But he's not a stunner. And if you've got an F2 champion who has been a protege for your team for several years, is only 20 years old and seems to have a lot of potential, and you're not putting him in your F1 car over Joe Guan Yu, I don't see when you would ever put them in your F1 car. Unless there's something Porsche can do in Super Formula and behind the scenes over the next 12 months to show that he has ticked the boxes he needs to and there are no question marks over him, I don't see how he commands an F1 seat from here. I think he needs something to go in his favour, whether that is Sauber not being appealing enough for 2025 for any other driver to want in before the the Audi project kicks in for 2026. I think that's the kind of thing that gets Porsche an opportunity because Sauber didn't want him for next year. And if any of the other rival teams rated him so highly that they thought, oh, Sauber's not taking him up, we've got a chance to steal him here, they'd have done that, and they haven't. So I don't say this to insult Porsche or be disrespectful or it at all, but the circumstances, the way this has played out, shows that even as an F2 champion at 20 years old, he hasn't done enough to convince people. And I don't see what he can do to change that in the next 12 months without some external assistance. Is there a Chinese Grand Prix factor here, though, as well? Is is Joe being kept in that seat because Sauber, maybe even F1 themselves a bit, are clinging on, just hoping they can get a Chinese Grand Prix over the line? It's on the calendar every year. It ends up falling off the calendar every year. Is If, if Joe is just kind of there filling a seat, he's done a perfectly fine job. You mentioned Mick Schumacher earlier. These guys come in, they do an okay job, they don't look out of their depth, fine. But is is he that little bit more secure because everybody who helped get him into that seat is desperately hanging on to make sure there's a Chinese driver on the grid if F1 finally gets its Chinese Grand Prix next year? Yeah, there's certainly eagerness from F1 to have a Chinese driver on the grid for the Chinese Grand Prix, which, which will happen because it's generally been COVID problems that have have stopped it happening the last uh, last few years. So that should happen. It's an interesting one because obviously part of the reason Joe's in that seat is because of the Chinese market, although it's not so much Chinese companies being drawn into sponsor. It's actually European and American companies wanting to partner with Sauber in order to try and get into the Chinese market. They've found that to be the more lucrative benefit for that. So yeah, there there is a little bit of that. It's it's true, it's true because you could make the argument that, oh, they haven't taken per share because they had Bottas on a locked-in contract for 24. Bottas had an option, but it was on Bottas's side, the option. So he was always going to take that up because I don't think there were going to be any better offers for him. So you could argue that a combination of the commercial appeal of Joe and the fact he's doing a solid job, you know, very popular in the team, hard worker, works very well with the guys in the garage. I just think the only problem with Joe is that edge of speed probably isn't there um, and we knew that before he got to f1 didn't we? exactly yeah he's brisk enough he's not slow but he's not super quick let's put it that way so you could you could make an argument that perhaps salva were locked in for this year and maybe there's a space they could put per share in in place of say bottas but they've got they've got money coming in they've got the audi gear up there's lots of drivers there being linked with you know people like carlos Sainz, alex albert esteban ocon 
they want to upgrade their driver lineup. And so it's very difficult, again, to see how Pochere becomes part of that landscape. And perhaps the way he could have done is if they got him in the car and, and he showed what he could do. So, yeah, it's, it's very, very tricky. Obviously, you see a lot of hand-wringing about, oh, the F2 champions aren't getting in. That would be Drogovic. And then uh, Pochere not getting in at all. Obviously, Piastri had the year before he got in. And obviously, De Vries did get a brief F1 chance, having won the 19 title. But... I think it probably does come back to what you were talking about earlier, Glenn. It's the, it's the quality of the champions. If you have a Charles Leclerc style, and you do get these waves, don't you? So uh, it partly depends on uh, on that kind of thing. But I, I, I guess, Scott, really what Pochere maybe is hoping for is that loss and opportunity, because that's the thing that can change it, can't it? I think that's what Djokovic is hoping for. He almost got it at the start of the year. Maybe the chance to jump into the car, do what Lawson's did and uh, do what Lawson has done and shown that he's a good, capable Grand Prix driver and put himself near the top of the list for anyone near, needing a driver. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like You just need that external variable to play in your favour. I think that's the only way. And then you grasp that opportunity with, with both hands. I think Lawson has done more for his reputation in, what, what was it, five appearances for, for Alpha Tauri, four or five appearances, um, than he had done in... F- the four or five years of his junior career before then and no disrespect to what he achieved then because he did some really really fun things in in his career so far like what I, I sincerely believe that that season where he just got randomly plonked in the DTM and just and outperformed Alex Albon um, in the DTM was like and he should have been the champion that year it was just only a ridiculous ridiculous bit of um, driving and uh, stupid controversy that denied him that Um but none of that added up to anything like the weight of um, the performances that he put in, in in the F1 car and obviously Singapore scoring points. But even, you know, the, the relative near miss of Suzuka where he beats Sonoda and stuff like this. So the question is whether Porsche, if he got that opportunity, would then grasp it. Because there's a reason Sauber hasn't taken him over, over Joe. And while I'm sure political elements like the the Chinese Grand Prix wanting some backing some some money for that for that seat probably played in you know if that's a if that's a serious racing team fit for the franchise model era of F1 then a mega driver a mega proche that they're totally convinced in is surely getting that seat over Joe and they haven't picked Porsche so is it his is it his raw speed I don't think so cuz I think his potential and his peaks are pretty fantastic is it his consistency is it the dependency is it that any mental aspect does he work hard enough is he intelligent enough you know there are so many things that go into being an f1 driver it's one of the reasons why joe's been pretty effective even though he doesn't have that that turn of speed so it depends what porsche is missing that will define whether or not whether he got an f chance uh, whether he got a chance in f1 and whether he made the most of it yeah, very much so. And it's an interesting trajectory for him because I almost feel like his stock is slightly lower as F2 champion now than it was, say, in the first half of his first F2 season. Obviously, he finished second in F3, stepped up quite young. He won the feature race at Monaco. That was almost when the momentum was there and everyone was like, oh, this guy could get really good. And then it just was a bit stuttering in terms of how F2 went. So while I don't violently adhere, adhere to the idea you've got to do it all in your first season in any category the trajectory there is I guess one thing that has probably counted a tiny bit against him it's momentum like people claim that this isn't a factor but momentum is massive for a junior driver there are drivers and I think this, this has been discussed openly by people who've made it to f1 there are drivers who just have an aura of they are getting to f1 about them in their junior days and it's actually quite interesting you look at the current Ferrari drivers you've got Charles Leclerc who was basically destined for F1 from the moment he stepped out of carts into cars and Carlos Sainz who has basically grafted his way into being a damn near elite F1 driver someone who peaked as a junior driver basically in his final year of junior racing where he was you know he was a good prospect a race winning prospect I think in every category he did but Glenn will know this better than me it was only really when he stepped up and won the 3.5 title that I think you made a real case of oh we should really start to take this guy seriously and impressed in the young driver test yeah exactly so the this is the kind of thing that happens and and with Porsche you know you're right there was a point in 2020 21 
where the world was at his feet. You know, he was, what, just 16, 17, stepped into F3, runner-up in that championship, super impressive, straight into F2. Wow, what's this guy going to achieve? And it's kind of flatlined since then. He's actually, in in a way, a less impressive third-year champion than Drogovic because Drogovic absolutely obliterated a, a good but not great field, whereas Porsche just about got the job done over the line. And if someone like, I don't know, like if you say like Oli Behrman, for example, if he wins F2 next year as a second year, yes, it's not as impressive as winning it as a rookie like others have done. But given that he'll see he won't even be 20 by that point and he'll have won it in his second season, there's still something about that that I think turns heads in the F1 paddock in a way that winning it as a third year just doesn't. Yeah, you mentioned momentum. That feeds into another word which is important in the F1 paddock, which is perception. And no matter how good a job you do, the third year element creates a perception. And just to come back to, you mentioned Science and Leclerc, the two parts of their careers that you mentioned there, I witnessed them both in person. So yeah, I remember Science came in with a, a kind of back of the grid team in 3.5 for some kind of one-off appearances in 2013 when the anointed next Red Bull superstar was supposed to be Antonio Felix da Costa. Uh, he'd come in mid-season the season before, looked amazing, was supposed to win the championship the next year. It didn't work out. Science came in, I think out-qualified him, maybe beat him in Monaco. And suddenly you're going, well, hang on a minute. His car is nowhere near as good as De Costa's. And that created a bit of pressure. De Costa and his team didn't deal with that pressure. And then you're right. Science, even at that point, it wasn't a case of Science has burst onto the scene and now he's the guy. He then had to graft the next year because... Again, he didn't have that perception around him. Yeah, he'd been passed over when uh, Daniel Kvyat got called up, I think, from GP3, if I'm getting it right. Uh, so Science had to work to break that. He had to force his opportunities. Those opportunities are a little bit easier to force if you are under the umbrella of an organisation like Red Bull, where they have a second team. So you're, you're trying to force your way into seats three and four of their organisation, whereas if you're Porsche, you're trying to get one of seats one and two. Um, but then Leclerc, I remember Leclerc doing some, get, I think I've said this before on the podcast, did some guest appearances in Formula Renault Euro Cup and there was a race in the wet, I think, where he came from the back of the grid to finish on the podium or something and immediately just everybody there was going, who's this guy? He's special. And then every time he turned up again, there was attention on him and he lived up to that attention every time. So, you're absolutely right. Some people just arrive and it feels like they matter straight away. And uh, that was definitely the case for Claire and not at all the case for science. I, f I feel like their F1 careers have kind of reflected that as well. You had science bouncing around from team to team and kind of impressing a bit more and doing a slightly better job everywhere he's gone. And now they've ended up together. And as we've seen over the last couple of years, there are times where science can out outperform Leclerc I, I don't want to say he's outworking him but I think the way he works enables him to maximize what he's got perhaps more often so there are ways there are ways that you can break through but it's very very difficult and I would say someone like Sainz is the exception in that case and of course we talk about momentum and the perception and that kind of thing we talked about Pacher but the guy who finished second in Formula 2 Frederick Vesti was in his second season 21 year old nobody's talking about He's done a perfectly capable job in the Mercedes and the young driver test in FP1. But he is the guy who is, at best, the second best prospect on the Mercedes roster because everyone's looking over to see how Andrea Kimi Antonelli does when he steps up to F2 next year, having won Formula Regional this year. So it's, it's a funny old uh, ecosystem. And it's an important thing to remember that it's not just about the pure results. It's how you do, how you achieve those results, how you work with teams, the reputation you build, people talk to each other, engineers, that kind of thing. So the people that build up the buzz usually build it up for a reason. And sometimes there's there's quite a lot of drivers who are very, very capable. I'm sure Vesti would do a perfectly decent job as an F1 driver, but he's not marked himself out as a potential superstar and probably the same with Pusher. Yeah, buzz is an, another important word there. And what I would say is um, buzz is your friend if you keep delivering but uh, but that buzz and that aura won't get you all the way if you're not performing. So it's it's important to have and it's a useful ally if you're doing a good job. But it doesn't mean that somebody who doesn't deserve 
to get all the way to F1 can get there just because they have a bit of buzz. Um, so that, again, that is a perception thing that I think sometimes gets missed. People think that some people are anointed as they they come out of carts and get kind of a magic carpet ride up the ladder. That accusation was levelled at Lewis Hamilton a long time ago. But Lewis only retained uh, his McLaren backing, or as it was sometimes called in karting in the lower junior rungs of the then British ladder, the golden credit card, only if he performed. Uh, and So that will always be the case. Yeah, and teams drop the ones that who are perceived to be the favoured protégés very quickly when the next big thing comes along because it's a ruthless kind of sport. They want the best possible thing. Every team is looking for the next big thing and performance is what dictates it. Well, thanks very much to Glenn and Scott for your insight. Head to the race.com. Don't forget the hyphen loads to read there. Heading into the off-season, we'll continue to churn things out. Listen to our other podcasts, including Bring Back V10s, hosted by Glenn Freem, which tells classic F1 stories. The Race F1 Tech Show with the excellent Gary Anderson. Our Formula E, MotoGP and IndyCar podcast as well. Also check out our YouTube channel, both long and short videos on there we're going to be back next week with our first review podcast which will be looking at the top 10 drivers of the year that one might come out fractionally later in the week than our normal monday because of the challenge of getting everyone together to record that but as always over the winter we're going to keep producing the podcast keep talking about f1 as there's always plenty of discussion points so stay with us for everything you need to know from the world of formula one The Athletic.